Kimberly was a child diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia. Getting her to focus wasn't an easy task until art came along. Learning became fun and improving was quickly part of the game that was art making. From messy handwriting to beautiful line art, Kimberly's watercolors quickly became a reference in this industry. If you'd like to hear more about Kimberly's story, please tune in as we discuss using art to lessen dyslexia, how to use comparison to measure your growth, ways to remove the pressure from making art, dealing with confidence issues, and tips on how to improve your line drawing. Want to be part of the show? Then send in your questions or topics you'd like to see covered to our email at hello at etcherlab.com. If you send us an audio recording, we might include it in the episode. Hi, I'm Manya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etcher, meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. Uh, Kimberly, can you take us back to the time that you realized that art was something you loved and had to be part of your life? Oh, I mean, I'd probably have to go way, way back. Like I remember in first grade, Mm -hmm. there was this kid who was this phenomenal artist and he would do these insanely detailed, like drawings of buildings, pencil drawings. And I was so jealous of him. I was like, I wish I was a good artist. Like, I just, I wish I could do that. (laughs) And I, I didn't feel good about my skills at all, but well, and also like, I had a hard time learning kind of the fine motor skills. Like when I was young, my handwriting was super messy. And so my art was super messy. I just remember I, I loved to draw horses and I still do but I had the hardest time getting their legs to be the same length. Like I draw them and then like a couple legs would be shorter. So I just draw the ground up to the legs. (laughs) I was like, that's how this works. There's a rock here. Oh my God. You have no idea how happy I am to hear that because one, I had the worst handwriting as well when I was a kid. And my art was super messy. I kind of, my art kind of grew messy with me, but I kind of learned how to make the messy decent. So that's, yeah. that's different path that I took. So I'm really, I'm really looking forward to hear how you went from that to what you're doing today, which is super fine, polished, gorgeous lines. And I'm like, I can't believe that you struggled with that. And I also did that thing, grabbing the ground and making it up to the horse's leg. Cause I also loved it. I'm not alone. Right. Oh my God. I don't know. I don't know why, but like drawing the legs the same length, it was impossible. I couldn't do it. <laughs> uh, if there is anyone whose uh, area of expertise is, is uh, I don't know, child development or something, um, if you have any thoughts about why this happens, because apparently you're not the only one, Kimberly, me too, please let us know in the comment section below because uh, this piqued my interest. It's a thing I need to learn more about. Okay. Well, I mean, going off of that, sorry to interrupt, but like going off of that, like I am dyslexic and I do have ADHD. And so I think that that made like learning to write a little bit harder for me somehow. That's not like scientific, but that's just like my interpretation. I felt like that kind of made the struggle harder. (laughs) That is very interesting. When did you realize you had dyslexia? Um, that was probably in about second grade. I just, I was very behind in my reading and my math and, um, my classes would kind of break off into reading groups. And I was always in the like slowest reading group. And one of my teachers, their son had actually just recently been diagnosed with dyslexia. And so she suggested to my parents that they have me tested for dyslexia because I had a lot of the signs. And so I went and I got tested and I got diagnosed with both. ADHD and dyslexia. Wow. And I'm glad it was so soon in your life yeah. because you were able to come up with strategies to get, I mean, not get over it because it's not something you completely get over, but make it better and work on it. And I'm assuming the sooner the better. So yeah, t- talk us a little bit about that. And also your art. I'm just interested 
in figuring out the relationship between dyslexia and ADHD and art making, but we'll get there. So yeah, continuing on your journey. Yeah. The legs of the horses were not the same length. No. Everything was messy. What did you do? Um, I kind of just kept drawing. Like, like the very basic thing is just that I kept drawing. It was something that I liked. And I know that some kids at some point, they realize that like maybe their art isn't as good as other kids are. And I did realize that. I mean, I was super jealous of the kid and his beautiful pencil drawings of buildings. They're super detailed. And so I did realize that on some level, but it never stopped me from continuing to make art. And it just kind of, because I'm ADHD, like I would just draw on my papers. I couldn't focus in class unless I was drawing. And so I just kind of like would sit there in class and draw. It was always horses. Like <laughs> I drew nothing but horses for like the first 18 years of my life. Was that because you just loved horses because of the stories you're, yeah, that was it. So were you in contact with horses or was just part of story? I, I was very lucky that when I was 11, I was actually able to start horseback riding. So like, I, I'm a bona fide horse girl, <laughs> like all the stereotypes, I fit them all. <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. And Do you find that there's any relationship between dyslexia and drawing? Do you feel like drawing helped you, uh, you know, not overcome, but take care of your dyslexia in any way? Yeah, I, I do think so. I, I think very much so. Um, it was kind of, so my parents are wonderful and very supportive. And so when school was really hard, because those things just did not come naturally to me. They always emphasized that there's kind of always like two sides to the coin where dyslexia made it harder to read. It made it harder to do math. But at the same time, because I saw the world a little bit differently than some people, it helped me be creative and it helped me create art. So kind of once I got to the point where I understood that like, oh, like I, I'm okay at art. Like, This is something that I do. And, and it started to kind of become like part of my personality. It really helped me to be like, okay, math is hard and I'm going to struggle there. But like I have art and the dyslexia, you know, helps me create. And then vice versa, like having that thing that I felt like I could hold on to, like, oh, I, I do have a skill and I do have a talent helps me overcome and, and go through the struggles of the rest of school. Can you, looking back with the experience that you have now, with the insights that you have now, most kids, and I was having a conversation about parenthood the other day with um, a, a coworker. Most kids, when they start learning a new skill, when it gets hard, and, and I'm saying kids, but it, this goes for everyone like kids and yeah. adults alike, when it oh, yeah. starts to get really hard because you're past that phase that you're quickly grasping onto the basics and you're seeing the improvement and then you get to that stage that you have to work really hard to improve. And it sounds to me that's where you were when you were struggling with the horses and the kid drew super well and you didn't and you were super aware of that. So you still pushed through you didn't lose interest and try to be good at something else can you figure out why oh that's that's a really good question like I feel like I'm gonna have to think about that for a second because that's not something that I've ever thought about um now like with schoolwork and stuff because schoolwork was also not easy um I remember like it was a chore to like push through, but I never felt that way with the art. Um, the art was, mm. was just kind of something that I did. I still, and I don't push it through and it was hard and you know what it meant to be better because you, you were looking right. at it visually. Right. It was in front of you. Right. Right. Like I, yeah, I understood that the kid was much better than I was at art and, and I wanted to do that, but Like it was never a chore. It was just kind of, I think I just loved making art 
whether I was good at it or not, like that was just something that I wanted to do. And, you know, I think I was kind of encouraged by it. So with dyslexia, basically your brain just thinks of things in a different way than most people. And so, you know, that makes reading and writing and for me, math much harder. But on the flip side, because your brain thinks of things differently, it can make creativity and drawing and stuff like that a little easier. And so I think at first I was super messy, but I just, I just had a love for it. I just kept doing it. And I think by the time I was in like fourth grade, I I started viewing myself as like, oh, I'm the artist kid. Like, this is what I do. And and I draw horses. (laughs) And So that started to kind of become part of my identity, but, you know, it was never a chore. I never pushed myself like, oh, I'm bad and I need to keep drawing and keep going. I feel like that as I got older and I started viewing it more as like a profession, then that's when I kind of started really analyzing things and being like, I need to improve. And then it was more conscientious. But when I was a kid, I think it was just, I loved doing art. And so I continued to do art. Do you think that's related to when you were, cause you're a professional artist. That's what you do for a living, right? So mm-hmm. once you got to that stage, how well you did in that field would kind of dictate how much you could make in that is your living, you know, how you can yes. live your life. So there's a little bit of a little bit, I'm, I'm being very, of the euphemism there's a little bit of pressure there because if right. you're not good and you see the competition and they're not just good and it's like oh I want to be like them they're good and they're taking clients and if I'm not that good I'm right. not getting the client so maybe that's where the pressure gets however a lot of our audience listening to this today not everyone but a lot of, a lot of them are hobbyists so they don't have mm-hmm. that pressure of I need to be really good because I need the money to make a living, but they still feel like they're somehow left behind, they're struggling, and sometimes something that starts out of love, because if you pick art as a hobby, it's because you really love it, it it gets muddy in the way, and it becomes more of a, a, a chore, like you were saying. Yeah, okay, so now that you mentioned that, so yes, you know, being a professional artist, there is kind of the, like, if I'm not good enough, I don't get clients. I don't get work. Um, and I do, I do have a part-time job and I want to be very, um, like transparent about that because art is hard and there are a lot of ups and downs. And so for me to have a part-time job, just to make sure that like, I can pay my rent, I can eat food that, that allows me to create better because I know that I'm taken care of. And then in, you know, the other part of the time, I can just focus on the art and not be concerned about, am I going to make ends meet right now? That makes but, a lot of sense. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, but going back, so I guess in high school, again, I remember I, ha- I still have this friend, but we were in some art classes together. And like she, even in high school, like she had her style figured out. She knew what she did as an artist and she was very good at it. And then there was another girl that I was, I wasn't as close to friends with her, but I always was like, oh man, like Holly, I need to be as good as Holly. So yeah, I guess I was feeling that pressure. Like, and it's not just like a monetary, I'm making money thing, but even just a, I want to improve my skills and I want to be better. Um, but I, I don't know if this needs to be overcome, but I do feel like it can lead to like burnout and artist block. Um, but I feel like as I've kind of gone into my career, I started thinking about art a little differently. Whereas then I was kind of like, oh, I need to be the best artist. And newsflash, I'm never going to be the best artist. Yeah, like, exactly. And part of that is because it's so subjective. Um, That's a really good point. 
And so that's kind of where I started going with this. I realized that I had my niche, like I had my audience and my style and kind of my little thing. And, you know, and I, I just kind of let go of appealing to everyone. Like I started to become happier with my artwork. I mean, it's, you always want to get better, but you know, I, I kind of found my style. I kind of found my niche and, and then I was able to kind of just let go of needing to be the best artist. And I mean, not to say there's still artists out there that I'm like, they're just so good, but it's a balancing act, right? It's not like, Oh, I finally had this epiphany and I will never feel down again about my art. No, (laughs) No, I have those days that I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. But I mean, I think one of the things that helped me get there was some of these artists that I just admire so much. Like, I think they're, you know, like they've reached the top. How could they possibly be better artists? And then when I would hear them echoing like, oh, I don't feel like I'm accomplished enough. I don't think, I don't feel good enough about my art. And I kind of just realized like that imposter syndrome probably isn't going to go away. Not totally. So you just kind of embrace it and be like, yeah, I'm not going to feel good enough. I'm not going to feel like the best artist in the world because I'm not. (laughs) And and just kind of realize that you are going to feel that way. That is true. And um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. It's like, we feel like there's something wrong with us if we say out loud, one, we are artists, like there's some kind of special requirement slash secret club that will allow you to say that you're an artist. You don't have to be a professional artist to be an artist. That's one. You don't have to make money to be an artist. I mean, a lot of people can be artists. Uh, it's it's a mindset. It's not a an achievement like in the game that you like achievement unlock. You now have the title artist. Congratulations! Do you want to use your new title? That's not that's right. not how it goes. And then yeah. there's the other issue that it's like, why does it feel so wrong? And I mean, I'm assuming I'm not the only one, but why does it feel so wrong to say out loud that I think my art is good? I'm not saying it's the best. I'm not saying it's good enough. I'm not saying there's no room for growth, but I'm being kind to myself saying, I like the art I do. Yes, I want to do better. Yes, I think I can do better. I'm pushing myself, but what I'm doing is good. I like Mm -hmm. it and I'll put it out there and I'll be proud. And when someone says, I love your art, it looks like it feels sometimes, and I've been working on it. It's hard to just say, oh, thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoy it. And be like defensive. Oh, but it's it's nothing and I'm nothing and this is not good enough and I'm not there yet. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I think, oh man, uh, this is, <laughs> we can deep dive on this and I don't yeah. understand all of the like psychology behind it, but that's a very good point. Um, you know, I think that one, when you make the art, you see the flaws that maybe other people don't see. So you're, and you're kind of like, I have my goals and I know that like, okay, for me, like getting my lights and darks approach, like just right is so hard. And I do lots of pieces where I look back at them and I'm like, I didn't get that dark enough. I didn't get that light enough. I don't have my contrast enough on this piece, but other people don't necessarily see that. And I mean, I feel like when you're like, oh, we have a hard time, like being like, oh, I, I do like my art. I, I feel good about it. And yes, I need to improve. I mean, I think that's a deep, like therapist psychology type of issue that I don't have all the answers to, but I think that just as a society, we you know, you don't want to feel like you're bragging. You don't want to feel like you're, you know, putting yourself above someone else. 
But at the same time, I, I feel like we're not very good at acknowledging our accomplishments. Yes. What you just said, it's super important. Highlighting exactly the words you said. We don't want to feel like we're bragging or saying we're better than someone else. That's what bragging is. Assuming you're better than the others. That's the definition of bragging. But if what you're saying is I'm, I'm good at what I do, yeah. that's confidence. That's not bragging. You're not saying you're better than anyone else. You're just right. acknowledging your worth. Yeah. So yeah, just wanted to leave that out there. Food for thought. Yeah. Cause I mean, I have friends who are phenomenal artists that I, I mean, like they still deal with that a lot and they, they don't know how to acknowledge what they have achieved. And, and that's super important. And I, like, I think every single person that I've ever met could probably work on that. Um, just included. like acknowledging, like, look, I, I've improved. That's, that's the other thing. Like looking back at where you were, I think is a good comparing yourself to yourself. Mm-hmm. I think it's very helpful. Mm-hmm. Go back you're, in your you're feed. Not. If you post on social media, see the old stuff, compare it to the new one. And then you're like, yeah, I'm better. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's a good way to kind of gauge it where you're like, I'm improving, but you're not, you're not going, Oh, I'm better than all these other people. You're just saying I'm better than I used to be. And I worked hard to get here. This is me clapping if the sound is not clear enough. Um, Now, I want to tie back what you were talking about, the dyslexia and the messy handwriting Mm -hmm. and the path that led you to today where your lines are so clean. Yeah. What's the story there? How did that go from night to day? I want to know the story. I think a couple of things, and, and I have full disclosure my initial sketches are very sketchy. They're, they're messy. I just draw very light, which that's actually how I got into inking my work was I have a very hard time, like pressing hard enough and building up my lines enough for them to be very readable in graphite. So my initial sketch is it's very sketchy. It's very loose, like lots of circles, just a bunch of different sketchy little things. Um, but I think one of the things I did and going back to handwriting in high school, at some point I was very into Lord of the Rings that, that was like my life, me and all my Mm -hmm. friends, that's all we talked about. And like, we had our little Tolkien club where we got together and we made elven cloaks. That's so cool. It was very fun. I really liked it. Like my little nerd self was so happy <laughs> that I found other little nerds that wanted to do that stuff. When I was a kid, I had that with Harry Potter, with some childhood friends. We did like, uh, we would go on each other's grandpa's houses in the middle of, you know, the fields and we would have our own Hogwarts version and we would split ourselves into like Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff because of course no one would be taking Gryffindor and Slytherin because that's for the movie. And we would create our <laughs> classes and our games. So I just, I my heart is filled with joy when I hear other people doing the same with the themes they love the most. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun. I, and I was such a geek, but I decided that I wanted to write like Tolkien. You know how they have like the little swirls and like oh it's all fancy and the little dots. So at one point during high school, I was just like, this is what I need to do. Like, I want to write like Tolkien. I want to write in this fancy handwriting and have it, you know, it was just English, but like have it look like Elvish a little bit. Oh and God. so I worked really hard. Like, cause my handwriting was very messy. Like at this point it was mostly legible, but I was like, no, I want to have good handwriting. And so I really focused on it and I started, and I would just like write my school notes in like Tolkien writing. And, and so I practiced having a very steady hand a lot through high school. Cause my goal was to write like Tolkien. I love so much that when you set your mind to something that you love it becomes Mm -hmm. so important to you that you get it done and it's never a chore it's just right wow hyper focus that's part of ADHD right I was talking to a friend who has ADHD and she was explaining it to me a little bit and she was like either very ditzy or extremely focused on one thing yes yeah. Amazing. I, I find that amazing. Okay. 
and how so we we didn't tie this back to your art so you were decided you wanted to be really good at art and you started working on it and can you tell us a little bit more about your art journey up until now yeah so you know kind of in high school i knew that i was a, a good artist um and and i really enjoyed doing art i had done the work i refined my fine motor skills so that I could draw better. And then I went to college because that is, you know, that is what you did. And because of the dyslexia and because of the ADHD, school was not easy for me. Like that was a very hard thing. So I got to college and I, of course, enrolled in a few art classes because that was fun, but I didn't really know what I wanted to major in. And I got in my art classes and I was like, well, I like this. And, you know, I'm, I'm not real great at math. Because at one point I wanted to like become an equine nutritionist because, you know, first girl, like, <laughs> but that required a lot of like chemistry and a lot of math and stuff that was very hard for me. And so I kind of was like, well, I'm not good at math, but like I can draw. So I was like, that's my major now. And to be honest, I didn't even know what an illustrator was at that point. Wow. Because at my college, you could follow like three different paths. One was graphic design, one was fine art, and one was illustration. And people would always ask me like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't even know what those are. <laughs> Cause I knew nothing. I just, I just drew for fun. <laughs> yeah. I am. I, I, yeah. I went to graphic design. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I feel like that's no longer a big deal now because of how easy it is to see things up on the web and it was not as easy right. before, but yeah, right. that aside. Okay. So you pick, which one of, which one did you pick? Well, I had, so the first class that you took is just like drawing still lifes in graphite and charcoal. And my still life, I got together a bunch of things like a hat that, and a like train ticket that I had gotten on um, a trip that I took. And my professor came to me and he's like, wow, this is very illustrative. Like you're telling a story here in your still life. And, and he asked me again, like, oh, are you going into illustration? And at that point I was like, yeah, that's, I guess that's just what I do. So I'm <laughs> yeah, going into illustration. Like, of course I am. I mean, what, what do you think? Me for? I totally understand what I'm doing here. Thank right, you. <laughs> right. I know what that means. Yes, sure. Illustration. And so that kind of launched me on that path. And so I graduated. And I think this is the hard part because, and things are different now, but definitely for me, when I was young, it was you go to college and then you go get a career. And it just doesn't work like that for art. Mm -mm. I mean, there are a few people that graduate college and they're like, I'm a full-time illustrator and I make all this money, but I went to school during the like downturn. And so publishing tanks, like right as I was going into school and being like, I'm going to be an illustrator. And so Publishing tanked, it wasn't what it used to be. It wasn't what my teachers all told me it was going to be. And I got out of school and I felt really lost. I like, I moved back in with my parents and I lived in their basement, you know, very stereotypical, like living in oh the my. parents' basement. And I, at first I tried, I was like, I'm just going to do this illustration thing. And I got a couple jobs and because I wasn't paying rent, it was okay. Yeah. But at some point I was just like, I need to like get out of my parents' house. Like there's nothing wrong with living with your parents. Like I know it's yeah, kind of stigmatized, but like it's totally fine. But I just, you know, it's nice to have a little space and yeah our own mental health sometimes, no matter how yeah. amazing the parents are. And I don't know how it is in the United States, but in Europe, uh, people are getting out of their parents' uh, home later and later and later. And what mm -hmm. we forget is, um, at least in my country, in Portugal, when my parents were young, well, first of all, 
right now people have kids starting at the age of 30. Before it would be at the age of 20. And before mm -hmm. they would not go to college and now they do. So they would start yeah. working way earlier and things were not as expensive as they were before. And it, we didn't have so many cultural things in going out and eating out. So they were saving way more money. They were spending less. They were getting earning more. And it was not as expensive to find housing. That all changed. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just putting that out there just in case you're listening to this and you're living with your parents and you're frustrated. It's completely normal. And uh, some people live with their parents for a long, long time. Like I lived with my mom and grandmother when I was a kid and it worked fine. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's totally fine. And, and yes, like same thing here in the United States, like people are living with their parents for much longer. And I, I mean, I lived with my parents for, for years, like to be completely honest there, I graduated college and lived with my parents for years. Um, but eventually I moved out and that's kind of when I started working the part-time job and I felt really bad about that for a long time. I was like, I'm again, it's that like, when can you label yourself an artist? And I was like, I can't label myself an artist because I'm not doing it full-time and I'm not like making a full-time living wage off of my art. Yep. And, and so I felt really bad and just over time, it was just like, that's just my path that helps me feel more secure about my whole life. And, and it's okay. It's, it's okay to do that. Exactly. Um, it works for you. You now have a part-time mm -hmm. job. You're getting your bills paid so you can be yep. mentally healthy to create without a lot of pressure. And you do the, what you love the most instead of doing those kind of jobs that you don't really like, but you have to pay the rent. So Right. Cause that, I think that that is something that a lot of artists fall into and that works for some people. You take all the jobs, whether you really think they're a good job or not. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is problematic when artists are taking very low paying jobs. And, and sometimes these low paying jobs are not because people have tiny budgets, but just because they've learned they don't have to pay artists well. Mm -hmm. And so people start taking those low paying jobs and then they get very burnt out because they're working all the time and they don't have work-life balance exactly. and they're still just struggling to make ends meet. Yeah. And that's horrible. Um, moving to the theme of uh, like today, I right, looking at your work, I see a lot of watercolor a lot of ink mm -hmm. and you talked about inking and why you do ink because your uh, pre-sketches are messy and then you refine them with ink and I'm assuming you do watercolor after you do the ink. Mm -hmm. so, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about your process? Um, yeah. So I, I do, I do very messy sketches. They're just very light <laughs> and they get erased later sometimes. Um, and then I will come in and do ink and I, I kind of came to this too, like one, my line art or my graphite is very light Two, I saw Pete DeSev's work when I was in college and I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I, I wanted to kind of bring that into my artwork. And so I started using, um, the, the ink and the watercolor and watercolor just seemed to kind of work for me. I tried digital for a little while <laughs> and I felt like my art was very generic. And then when I moved back to the watercolor, it kind of just gave it something a little bit different. And I felt like it helped mm -hmm. me stand out a little bit more. Wow. Yeah, one medium helped the other because it kind of changed the way you were perceiving things mm -hmm. and how you observe your reference. I, I guess, I don't know, I'm making like blind guesses here. Is that um, accurate? I... I don't really know what it was. I just kind of clicked with the watercolor. Um, when I was working digitally, I always kind of felt like I was kind of emulating someone else's style. And when I worked with watercolor, I felt like it was my style. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that so much. Yeah. But yeah, I basically do art like it's a coloring book. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, like, I draw it, it but then I just color it in. 
And yeah, you know, just start quote with- unquote, just be clear, yes. just coloring takes a lot of work. It's not just oh, yes. drawing is done. So now it's easy. There's a lot of work that goes into coloring alone. Yes. Yes. Well, and I also kind of leaned on this style as a crutch too, because especially earlier on in my career, my line work was much stronger than my painting skills. Mm -hmm. And so, and my line work with digital would kind of go away. And I would get that feedback a lot from people like, oh, I really liked the sketch and, and it's missing something now. Oh my God. I can relate so much. (laughs) Yeah. So that's how you got over that problem. You started focusing more on the line and Mm -hmm. painting became secondary to line. Yes. Yeah. And it works beautifully. I mean, just go through Kimberly's Instagram feed and be in awe. So yeah, so what, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, you go. I just uh, asking, what kind of subjects do you love drawing the most and what what captivates your your eye um i i'm a geek i'm a fantasy geek (laughs) specifically as we've already discussed um so i love kind of fantasy things and then i love animals and i finally branched out past just horses (laughs) but i love i love drawing little woodland creatures Mm -hmm. and I love drawing them in little outfits. And this is something that is real in my real life. You know, my little, well, my kitty gets out of it, but like I make my dogs wear clothes all the time. (laughs) I'm like, no, you need to wear clothes. So I love to draw animals wearing clothes. Yeah, man, I was just going through and it looks like it's not quote unquote, just animals uh, using clothes. There's a lot of story to the single pieces you've drawn. Oh my God, I just found one of a llama. Um, so yeah, I know you love a lot of Tolkien, inspirational stuff. You're a geek still. It's not like I look at your art and I think of Tolkien in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. I just see a lot of fantasy there. So how do you draw inspiration to apply it to your own original pieces? Um, yeah, I think... Some of that, I, like, even still, I do love Tolkien, but a lot of the books I read are, like, YA or middle grade. So I just kind of lean to that a little bit more. Um, But I think, just like anything, your style is kind of um, an expression of part of yourself. and. I think that's why, like, when, you know, because before I tried to really emulate other artists very closely and just kind of as I let a little bit more of myself peek through the art, it got better and people started recognizing my art more. So I think it's all inside everyone because, I mean, everyone has their own unique experiences that literally no one else has and so like their style the stories that they tell with their art you know when you're authentic to that and oh like I kind of hate using the word authentic because I feel like it's so overused right now yeah but in this context I think it's the best word that you could use just being true to your likes you you all we all kind of go through a phase in our lives where we love this weird geeky things and then we go to high school and then we kind of have to hide that we love them because it's embarrassing and then you go to college and you find other people who love the stuff you'd you'd love and then you can just like yeah I love that too and then finally when you accept it you bring that into your art and that makes it unique and personal to you and that's how you develop your style and how people can see that that art is yours like at the beginning of this interview before we hit record I realized that, so I'm I, like, just to give you context, dear listener, I reached out to Kimberly for this interview and I had this nagging feeling that I knew her for somewhere, but I'm like, maybe just because I follow her art or something. And then it turns out we had been in touch a long time ago. Yeah. And that's yeah. what happened. I recognized Kimberly for her art, nothing else. 
So I think that it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's such a good story to tell too. I feel like I appreciate art on a lot of different levels. Like some is highly detailed. Some is, you know, but because it's that person's unique story coming out. Like I think all art is beautiful because it's just, it's that person sharing a little bit of themselves where, and you can't get that anywhere else. But and, them. and this all makes a lot of sense, but I still think, think it's a bit too vague. So you said that you were emulating until you as an artist came out of that and then you develop your own style, but mm. how do you really do that? Like what was the process for you? Right. And this is going to be so frustrating to so many people is I really just kept doing it. Um, I, I emulated other people. I kind of took the pieces of that art that worked for me, that fit my style. Um, as we were just talking about that, the course that we were both in, I tried doing digital for a while and you know, I learned really good things there, but it didn't feel like me. Um, so just a lot of trial and error and a lot of drawing, just a lot of putting my pen on the paper, trying out different styles, trying this, trying that until I finally kind of found something that was working for me. And then I also want to add, cause I feel like, I feel like I hear people talking about this then being worried about your style changing, like after you've found it, but I don't think you have to worry about that because if it's still authentically you, like pe people will be drawn to it. People change. So of course, try out the style changes with them. It's part of your yeah. soul kind of. So it's attached to you yeah. forever. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Um, getting a little bit more nitty gritty about art making now, because we're uh, nearing the end of this interview. You have a live demo with us on June 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. What will you be doing with us? Um, so for the live demo, I'm going, well, I actually have some of the art right here. Should I show it? Oh yeah, please. If you're watching, if you're only listening to the audio version, please hop over to our YouTube um, episode so you can oh my god you can see a beautiful rabbit yeah so I will be painting this and discussing color theory and like well yeah yes that's what I'm doing in the live demo and I'm assuming that the drawing will be downloadable so our audience can mm -hmm. grab it so you can just grab the sketch the drawing yeah. not the sketch that Kimberly made and you can paint if you want, though it's a live demo, so just uh, making sure to communicate the point is not for you to paint alongside Kimberly, but Kimberly to show her process. And if you want a step-by-step -step tutorial, that's why we have a workshop with Kimberly afterwards. And you can hear all about that during the live demo, which is free. So please join, link with, will be on the post associated with this episode at edgerlock.com forward slash Johnson. Um, Okay, you will be talking about color theory. Anything more specific that you can uh, give a little sneak peek of? Um, let's see. So I I will be talking. So we'll kind of be focusing a little bit on um, complementary color mm -hmm. schemes. I mean, there's a lot, but that's the one that we'll be focusing on. And um, so I've painted out a little one. Let me see if I can find it. So I've painted it out. So we'll be kind of recreating this image. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little, if you're listening to the podcast, it's a little bunny drinking tea. Um, and I'll be discussing like how to pick your colors and how to make them harmonious. And um, yeah, I, I think it'll be really fun. And I think it'd be so fun if people want to paint alongside or they Definitely. want to try it on their own after. Yeah, because we get the recording, you can watch it afterwards and just play it at your own pace and pause mm -hmm. it. Will you be using paint straight for the pan or the tube or will you be doing some mixing as well? I will be doing mixing. Okay, and cool. and I, I do want to go over that as well because I think that's very key in making harmonious colors. And just making sure that everyone's on the same page. We're talking about watercolor. So uh, yes. grab your supplies. And I think this is going to be a treat. And since we're talking about watercolor and before wrapping up, what was 
the hardest thing that you've encountered while making art? Ooh, honestly, I, I think it is like your own self-doubt. Like, I, I think that is the hardest thing to overcome that, cause I, I don't know a single artist that hasn't at some time kind of reevaluated and being like, should I really do this? Should I really share this with people? Should I really make this a career? You know, what, whatever level it is, I feel like we all kind of feel that way because it is like your art is part of you. And when you're showing it to other people, especially on the internet, it can be a larger audience. It can be very intimidating. You're opening yourself up in a very personal way. I feel because my art is very personal to me. You're opening yourself up to criticism and that's, that can be hard. And especially when you already have like the little, the little monsters in your head that tell you negative things about your art and about yourself, it can be hard because you're worried about hearing that echoed from your audience. Yeah. Basically a confirmation that your suspicions were true. Yeah. And they're not, I, I, I'm just having this thought right now, you know, I forgot the expression, but we have this thing, everyone has it. Uh, I forgot the words, uh, but it's when you look at yourself, a picture, a mirror, you see all the flaws of yourself, mm-hmm. but you don't really see it with other people. And I think it's the exact same thing with art because it's like you said, it's so personal that you see everything that is wrong with it. It's like that friend that you have that is so beautiful and she's like, oh my God, I have such a long nose and <laughs> my, my, my skin is a mess and I have like this little bit of whatever here and there. And you're like, but you're right. so, like, what? I think it's the same thing with our art. Yeah. So any advice you'd like to leave our audience, our listeners before we, we go away? Yeah, so I think just kind of, you know, building on the thing that we've already been talking about of just keeping making art. Like if you want to improve, that's the number one thing you can do. I I remember when I was going to college. um, So the college that I went to art is one of the biggest majors at the whole college. But after the first semester or two, a lot of people drop out of that major. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that, but it's interesting because, you know, sometimes I meet someone at the beginning of school and, you know, their art was, you know, maybe needed some refining and they needed to build some skills. And then some of those people, by the time we graduated, were on such a professional level that it was just incredible. And And it was hard work. Like, I think that hard work and like just keeping at it, because when I say hard work, like, you know, please have a life balance. I think that's super important too. But if you just kind of keep at it and you don't let yourself get down and and you don't quit, like if you just keep going, you're going to get good. Like that, that, that's just the fact. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're that person that is like, oh, I can't draw a stick figure. Like even that person, if you keep going, you're, you're going to make beautiful art. What was your favorite subject as a kid? Kimberly loved drawing horses and surprisingly enough, me too. So what about you? Let us know in the comment section of the post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash Johnson. That's E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B dot com forward slash J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, simply let us know in the comment section below. If you're enjoying the podcast, please help us keep the show alive. You can subscribe and give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab.com forward slash go forward slash Apple. Or if you're more of a YouTube viewer, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our most recent videos. Sharing is caring and every little bit helps. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Until then... Let's make more art. Well, you have a cat and a puppy. And are they good friends? Um, not right now. (laughs) They were good friends for a little while. And then the puppy got older. And then he was like, I want to play with you. But he's double the size. So she's like, "Mm, we're not that good of friends. (laughs) 
it's the same story between my kids and my son.